And I'm here to introduce you to our session, Building and Scaling. This panel aims to discuss a wide variety of topics, such as what traits the most driven and successful entrepreneur share, what a Silicon Valley culture is about, and its way of building new things, how to create and scale billion dollar companies, and certainly the importance of hiring and retaining the right people. For this discussion, we will proudly have two Stanford GSB alumni, Vinod Kozla and moderated by Carlos Brito. Vinod Kozla is an entrepreneur, investor, and technologist. After graduating in electrical engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology, Vinod failed to start a soy milk company to service the many people in India who did not have refrigerators. His startup dreams led him to Silicon Valley, where he received an MBA from Stanford. His start, uh, driven by the frustration of having to design the computer hardware on which the DAISY software needed to build, Vinod started Sun Microsystem in 1982. In 2004, Vinod formed Kozla Venture to assist entrepreneurs to build impactful energy and techno technology companies, focusing on both for-profit and social impact investments. His goals remain the same, work and learn from fun, from fun, knowledgeable entrepreneurs, build innovative and highly impactful companies, and spend time with a partnership that makes a difference. Carlos Brito received a degree in mechanical engineering from the Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro and an MBA from Stanford GSB. Brito joined Ambev in 1989, where he held roles in finance, operations, and sales before he, appointed, he was appointed as CEO, CEO in 2004. He's a member of the board of directors of Ambev and of the advisory board of Grupo Modelo as well as an advisory council member of the Stanford Graduate School of Business. When this conference was just an idea on a piece of paper, Brito was there to inspire us and make this happen. Thank you for being a supporter and an enthusiast of this, on this road to transform Brazil through technology and innovation. Please join me in welcoming Vinod Kozla and Carlos Brito. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Okay, I can feel the energy. That's good, that's good. Vinod, it's great to have you here. Thanks for being here with us, spending time with us. And in the intro here, uh, it was mentioned that you have three different verticals in you. You're an entrepreneur, investor, and technologist. So I'd like to ask questions on all these three verticals. And if you don't mind, I'll start with the entrepreneur side of you. You often talk about... Well, first, first I have to say before you start, I, I love the entrepreneur side because it's much more of a lifestyle than a job or a career. And I get excited in any room full of entrepreneurs. Oh, that's what we so have like, here, right? <laughs> that's, that's what we have here. <laughs> so... I'm starting off from a good, a good place because I picked your favorite topic, so that's good. <laughs> good. So you often say that for you, when you start a company, it makes a big difference if your ambition is to start a $0 million company as compared to a $0 billion company. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. Please. Um, one of the questions that always comes up is the people you expect to make large innovations, never make large innovations. So uh, I enter these conversations. Anybody from any of the consulting firms, McKinsey, those kind of places? Uh, you'd be embarrassed to raise your hand uh, <laughs> after you hear the rest. It was a loaded, it was a loaded yeah. question. There are, it was a loaded question. There's experts who always define what can, can't be done. And then entrepreneurs break those rules. So when I look across the last 40 years, I haven't seen one large innovation come from somebody who knew the area they were innovating in, um, somebody who was an expert in their area. They just are too conventional in their thinking. 
why I love entrepreneurs is they drive all the innovation by thinking fresh. So if you look at cars, General Motors or Volkswagen didn't innovate cars. What are the two most important car breakthroughs in the last 40 years? Tesla and Waymo. Both of them from people who had never worked in the car industry. If you look at media, did CBS or Fox or any of the media companies innovate? No, almost all of the change in media happened with YouTube and Twitter and Facebook and then Netflix. People who knew nothing about media, they didn't even know they were in the media business when they started. Uh, you can look at space. It happened with SpaceX and Rocket Labs and not Lockheed or Boeing or Airbus. Uh, I am hard pressed to think of one large innovation. Retailing, it wasn't Walmart, it was Amazon. So no matter which area you're dealing with, experts in an area will always tell you why things can't be done. And entrepreneurs discover ways to do things that are surprising and from left field, and they break all the norms. So when we do healthcare, I say don't hire anybody who comes from healthcare if you're going to start a healthcare company. If you're going to do food, don't hire anybody from any of the food companies. And, and so it goes on and on. Interesting. Uh, one, one definition I heard once that uh, is very similar to the one you just gave about entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are people that look around the world and see the world as a broken place. And they see every process, every business, every industry, and they say, no, this is broken. There must be a better way. And they go after that better way. Yeah, but there's more than that. And this was the other half of the question you asked. Does mission matter? What happens in, with most experts, because most people experience in industry, they, all, they know all the ways things are done and all the things not to do, right? And what happens is when you're innovating, things don't work out. If you're not missionary about what you're trying to get done, you abandon the path, you go do something else. If you're a missionary tied to a goal, you keep banging your head against the wall till you discover the path. Uh, how many people who are entrepreneurs here? Good, a lot. You know how hard it is to be an entrepreneur. How many dark days there are, how difficult it gets. You don't know how to meet payroll. Some big company is in your way, but you keep figuring out ways around the problem. And necessity is the mother of invention. And this is why when you have a mission and you don't give up despite overwhelming odds and dark days and down days and payroll misses, this is why you succeed and why it takes real missionary zeal to do large problems. So in that vein, what do you think are the best entrepreneurs in your experience and people you have found or invested in? Are they the ones that are passionate about solving a problem? Or are they the ones that are passionate about a solution? Well, first, there's no one class of entrepreneur. But the people who go after really big ideas are really people who are passionate about a problem. They say, this is the problem I'm going to solve, whether it's healthcare for all or housing for all. Uh, and then they figure out how to do it. Uh, if you look across the history of most of the successful startups, where they ended up doesn't look anything like where they started. This is why business plans for startups is a bad idea. Uh, uh, there's one or two good uses for business plans, but I won't divert. Uh, you you want to solve a problem, and you want to keep iterating and zigging and zagging and changing plans and changing approaches and tactics, but you want to keep your mission or vision intact. Um, I always give an analogy. Entrepreneurs have a very clear vision of climbing whatever their Mount Everest is. And you have to have that large vision, 
but nobody got to Everest in one straight shot. You have to get to base camp, then to camp one, camp two, camp three, camp four, and then Mount Everest. Um, and it's a zigzag path. If you took a straight path up to Mount Everest, you wouldn't reach it. So this, be, this idea of being obstinate about your vision, the problem you're passionate about solving, but be flexible about your tactics, how you zig and zag through the morass of daily activity. It's an unusual combination. Good entrepreneurs have both the vision and well as the pragmatism to be zigging and zagging, changing plans, adopting very easily. And for entrepreneurs to start a company, they need, of course, people. They need to attract talent. And you're often, you often say that a company becomes the people it hires, not the plan it makes. Mm -hmm. In a world where everybody's fighting for talent, especially in a region like this, the Valley, how do you attract, what's your insights, or what have you learned that talented people are attracted by? And then how to retain them once you yeah. attract them? Uh, so there's many types of people, and again, you use a different story. But by and large, the best companies start with the vision and get people on their mission to join the team for that mission. And then when you go through ups and downs, people don't leave because they're bought into your vision. But by and large, I find the single biggest mistake entrepreneurs make is not assemble the team early for the large vision. So you mentioned this idea of zero million dollars. What's the difference between a zero million dollar startup and a zero billion dollar startup? It's attitude towards the kind of team you want to build which in five years will result in what you end up doing. My view is generally the plan you make generally keeps changing every three months and is not relevant. And how you change the plan depends on the team. The team you build early ends up determining what you end up doing, not the plan you make, because the plan changes so often, but the team stays. If you hire a team for a much larger vision, then you're going to build that company through all the iterations, machinations, left turns and right turns and zigs and zags. If that team has this big idea in mind, they will gradually move towards it, discover that, for, uh, that path to the large vision. So the company you build is the team you hire, not the plan you make. Perfect. And when you're thinking zero billion dollars, you may have zero in revenue, but your mindset is different the ambition. than when you're trying to build a small company. You know, another one, uh, last one on this topic of the entrepreneur. You were the founder of Sun Microsystems. Mm -hmm. And that was an iconic company that changed lots of things here in the Valley. If you still had Sun under your belt, in the world of experimentation and things that are moving very fast, how would you equip Sun to be able to be effective in this kind of world, yeah. a big company? So let me answer the question more generally first, and then I can come back to this. Uh, innovation in big companies is not possible. Incremental innovation, maybe. Large innovation, not possible. Not only can't the experts innovate, the big companies just fundamentally are unimportant to innovation. I have a fairly radical view. Uh, remember I talked about how hard it is being an entrepreneur, ups and downs, bad days, tough obstacles, insolvable problems in your way. Uh, the press has this very romantic view of entrepreneurs. Daily life, if those of you entrepreneurs know, can be really, really tough. Um, I spend 90% of my time dealing with problems entrepreneurs have, 10% with the upside successes. Uh, if you look at that mechanism, if you were doing that in a big company, the first time you ran into a problem, people go to a different job, move to a different division. If there's an escape hatch, you're not going to innovate greatly. If failure in a company isn't rewarded, 
then you're not going to take large risks. And without large risks, you can't have large innovation. So I like to say my willingness to fail is what gives me the ability to succeed. When you have a lifestyle around a mission you have, you can do that. And you can keep banging your head against the wall. When you're in a large company, you're on a career path. And career paths basically say you have a series of small successes, so you keep getting promotion. It's, it's fundamentally the wrong way to encourage innovation. One good example, there's a large company in Tata, uh, called Tata in India. And what I heard um, is they used to, and I don't know if they still do it, give a prize for the best failure of the year. That means somebody who took a risk, even if it failed, they got rewarded. That's not the culture. Uh, that's not the failed person isn't the one who gets promoted. And that's why big companies culturally cannot innovate. But that is a big company. So they, they, they apparently a found unusual a Unusual example of trying to solve found this. A way. OK. Let me now go to uh, your investor side. So when you're trying to, to bet on companies, ideas, founders, uh, and you often say that unreasonable people are the ones that change the world, right? What you bet more, on an idea or, or a founder? Well, by far, the most important thing is the founder. And if you're trying to say for large innovation, it's how stretchy, how much the founder stretches their goals. And so you have to be a total optimist, totally persistent, unreasonable about your goals. Uh, all those things make for great entrepreneurs. Um, you know, I'll give you a small example. I didn't go into the sun history. When we started, every investor said, hey, you're building this great graphics terminal. Uh, in fact, the Computer History Museum has the early suns. Uh, why don't you become a graphics terminal add-on to deck waxes and mainframes and mini computers? Totally reasonable thing to do. Uh, and we said, oh, no, we're just going to replace those machines, not just make them much more effective. Uh, in retrospect, when you're four 25-year-olds and say you're going to beat IBM and DEC and Data General and Prime and Burroughs and you can go through the list of computer companies and say, we're going to eliminate all of them. That's totally unreasonable, not sensible, and it's where large innovation comes from. So Another that's one. an important characteristic of entrepreneurs. That's important. Now, whether initially or later, good entrepreneurs gravitate to good markets. And their investors can guide you and help you. The right kind of investment and help uh, guide you into the right markets because you want to deploy the best talent against the best markets. In talking about investors, you also get a lot of uh, you know, peer pressure from or, or, or negative reviews from some of your peers because you often say that 90% of the investors do harm to the founders as opposed to do good to the founders because of their KPIs and motivations and short-termism. So what's a good investor? What, what well, should a founder so, look in so an investor? First thing I will say is in all my life, I've been doing this for close to 40 years. Uh, I've never called myself an investor. So I don't consider myself an investor. I sort of say my job is being an assistant to entrepreneurs. So I say I'm a venture assistant, not an investor. Um, I, I don't even allow people to run rates of return or spreadsheets in our firm when we invest. If you looked at the large last 100 investments, you won't see a single IRR calculation. You, you, it's just not what we do. It's like, is this a good team? Is this a good market? Let's try and make some magic happen. And there's not enough precision to put things in a spreadsheet. 
and you're fooling yourself. Just like I said, planning doesn't help. Financial plans are just even more less relevant. Um, there's ways to assess risks and how you eliminate risks. So there's uh, sensible ways to approach. I say you plan to plan, you don't make a plan. And when you plan to plan, you change your plan every three months, going after risks in a business and systematically eliminating the risk. Um, we still screw up a lot, but I find my role as mentoring and guiding entrepreneurs, assisting them in this task of how to, what's the right team to compose? What's the right iterations to do? How do you manage the risk of if you mix, miss your plan by 500% or 80% the other way? Uh, how do you respond to it? What's your contingency plan? So there's a lot of work to be done, but it's very, very different than, uh, this is why I don't go to board meetings. I can't even stand other investors talking about regular board stuff as if things are predictable in a startup. They're not. So what would a bad investor do that's so bad for a founder? What kind of conversation would go in a boardroom, so, would happen in a boardroom that's so bad so for? So go back to my analogy of Mount Everest, okay? But climbing Mount Everest, I said first you have to get to base camp. Base camp means revenue, business, some proof, maybe even cash flow break even. If there's another path that leads to cash flow break even much sooner, more convenient, but doesn't lead to getting to camp one and camp two and camp three later, if you're not collecting assets to get beyond base camp, then it's a bad idea to pick up that revenue. And if you're a financial investor, you're going after revenue and profits, not the assets to build a large business long term. Most of the time, people get bad advice on this topic. Like, just getting to break even anyway may distract you from your long-term path. Uh, less revenue may be better than more revenue, but if you're a financial investor, you almost never view it that way. The other thing that's important is some investors have a two or three or four year time horizon and the others have a five, 10 year time horizon. And they're saying, what are the assets that are really valuable to build a business around? So in your view, you said one thing in the, in the, in the first block, which is, which is the entrepreneur needs to be somebody who is very resilient as yes. a mission. What are, what are the two traits of a good entrepreneur founder would you mention, other than being the grit and the resilience? Well, vision, vision. which is, often unreasonable vision. I can do more than all of the car industry can do, is what Elon Musk said. Uh, totally unreasonable. Um, but then persistence and belief system. You know, Elon Musk went bankrupt, two or th or almost went bankrupt two or three times because he kept putting his personal wealth into his company because he so believed in his mission. It takes that kind of persistence, resilience, to really believe in what you're doing. And, and that's often the characteristic. You know, I still remember when Google got an offer, to, it was only a couple of years old, to be bought for a billion dollars or something like that. I forget the exact, they just said, no, we can build a hundred billion dollar company. That sounded pretty unreasonable when you're a bunch of kids in your 20s. <laughs> Let me now go to the technology side of you. So you often say that Silicon Valley is not a place, but a culture. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. Please. So what matters is what's the ecosystem around you. What's magical about Silicon Valley is, you know, if, and let me speak, if I went to India today, he said, who are the great executives? It'd be somebody who's been at Cisco or IBM or GE for 15 years. Uh, that's considered a good executive. When I see a resume like that, 15 years at a large company, I say, you're not hireable in the real world of startups. Like, that's a bad resume for a startup. Okay? So 
It's a cultural view. We will not use past experience. We will le learn fast by trying lots of experiments and reason from first principles how to approach this market. Um, so uh, when Coursera, an education company, hired the president of Yale University to be their CEO, I said, guaranteed failure, right? <laughs> uh, it's just, uh, right? Uh, and he's a pretty good guy, but in the context of an entrepreneurial startup, the wrong person. He'll get mad at me for mentioning names. Uh, but uh, I, I think this whole notion of culture, of experimentation and learning fast and failing often, but in non-catastrophic ways, and not worrying about what others think, what the peer pressure is, being internally driven from your gut, uh, that's what uh, entrepreneurship is about. What else is important to culture? The support system. You know, in Silicon Valley, it's pretty common for investors to say, you're not spending enough money. Most parts of the world, it's like the opposite. Uh, prove it, then I will invest, as opposed to, oh, that's a bold vision, we'll give you money. Investors here tend to be more patient, want more risk, not less risk, for bigger outcomes. Um, the right executives will join a startup much more, the better executives would rather join a startup than a big company. Uh, they'd rather have a lot of stock options than a healthy cash salary at a big company. Uh, those are cultural things, whether it's the team you're trying to build, the investors you have, the rest of the support system. That's why I say it's a culture and ecosystem. Um, can it be replicated in other areas? Yes. Has it been replicated? Probably not. A little bit in Shanghai. Um, you've seen that, so it's proof it can be done. And you see some of it uh, developing in China. Uh, but it can be done in any part of the world. I think there's a couple of drivers. Lots of technical talent that wants to take risks, right? Go after these mission. This empowerment saying it's okay to do unreasonable things. Uh, I'll give you my favorite current example. How many of you have tasted the impossible hamburger? Oh, good, fair number of hands. Uh, like six years ago, this professor we, we, from- we, we had it today at lunch. Oh, awesome, him. awesome. Six years ago, it was six years ago, this professor from Stanford came to me and said, I'll give up my tenure. Uh, one person then said, not only will I give up my tenure, for those of you who are researchers, he said, I'll give up my Howard Hughes Fellowship. Probably one out of a hundred Stanford professors might get Howard Hughes Fellowship which means they never have to do a proposal. They're basically funded for life to do anything. He said, I'm gonna give it all up for one goal. I'm gonna eliminate all animal husbandry on the planet. Like, talk about an unreasonable goal. He said 30 to 50% of the planet's land area is used for animal husbandry, whether it's for grazing, cattle growing corn for feed or uh, and I'm going to change all that system. Uh, that's totally unreasonable, but it took me one meeting to say, we'll fund you. We didn't do due diligence. We said just the goal and your credentials as a, as a scientist and entrepreneur is good enough for me. Uh, so I forget the question I was asking, but this, <laughs> this idea of... I guess, the, I guess the whole thing started some half an hour ago with the question of how to transfer. But, the, but the, the I do want to make one more Silicon point, Valley. the question you haven't asked. <laughs> Reverse mentoring. <laughs> hey, I get excited about these things. I have a bunch of things I want to talk about. Um, <laughs> but I often get asked, 
what areas are open to innovation. Right? If you had asked anybody, even in- Those are my list here, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> See? And straighting it. Uh, is food open for innovation? People would say no. And I'd say absolutely yes. Right? My point here is no matter what area you're in, if you're creative enough, there's a startup to be done that's really revolutionary. More importantly, there's a technology that can dramatically change the economics of that area. And it doesn't matter what area it is. It isn't just about software. It's not just about pharma, pharmaceuticals or biotechnology. It's every area. So, uh, you know, when we funded hamburgers, we also funded rocket labs to do rocket launches. Very successful. Uh, two areas that people would say to me, that startups don't do these things. We have funded 3D printing whole buildings in construction. Um, we just funded a Mark V airplane. Um, transportation. Like, I can't find one area where you can't completely disrupt the economics of the area. And I did this exercise a while ago. I'm 64, and I said, if I'm going to work for 20 years, 80 hours a week, I'd better have fun areas to work on. So I looked at a, all of the US GDP, which is representative of global GDP. And I asked the following question. Is there what parts of GDP can I not find 100 to 1,000 percent improvements in economic efficiency? And I was shocked. Just sitting by myself, I could think of the technical approaches I would take to have these very large changes in, in the economics of almost all parts of US GDP. So I wrote a paper which I published about a year ago. It was more a 20-year plan for myself, because in your 60s, you start thinking about at least at some point you have to stop working. And I figured it was the 80s, uh, my 80s. Um, so it's called reinventing societal infrastructure with technology. My point is, what surprised me is I couldn't come up with an area I couldn't innovate in whether it was food, whether it was construction, whether it was housing, whether it was education, whether it was medicine. Uh, my son's build, trying to build a primary care physician AI. Like, why do we need doctors when AI will have that knowledge far more than any human being could? So no matter what area, if you look at it unreasonably enough, you can define a path to innovate and the technology to innovate. So just, just going back to that question of Silicon Valley being, being a culture, not a location, in your view, for this culture to travel, what would be the, the one or two barriers that you would see that would be harder to replicate elsewhere? Because we're all Brazilians, we would love to get this culture to go to Brazil. Yeah. So uh, I do think it can travel. Part of it is an education system which creates these experts because large technology breakthroughs cause large economic advantages which turn into companies. So education is clearly very, very important. You have to be a guru in AI or 3D printing or uh, biotechnology or pick your favorite area. So that's important. Countries that don't have that becomes harder. Uh, Israel's a great example of an ecosystem that's developing. Uh, then you need a fair amount of luck. And if one or two or three companies start and have become very successful, it gets 100 more 20-year-old kids to say, I want to do that. So role models become really, really important, way more important than people realize. If somebody from your country or neighborhood started a company and became a very successful entrepreneur, it's much easier for a new kid coming along out of university to say, oh, I can do that too. 
I came to this country because I was 16 in India when I read about Andy Grove, a Hungarian immigrant in Silicon Valley starting Intel. I said, oh, if an immigrant from Hungary can do this, I can do this too. And I fell in love with the idea. So these role models are very important. And as the bevy of startups and look at 700 people here wanting, interested in entrepreneurship, a few successes will become the role models. They also become the people who can then take the higher risks in investing in new entrepreneurs locally. Traditional financial institutions will not invest in these entrepreneurs. They'll want too much proof, too much. In, yeah, I, I see this in India too. The traditional investors want to look at spreadsheets. How do you do a spreadsheet on Twitter when it's starting up? Yeah. Uh, so people start taking risks in investing because some people have made money, some entrepreneurs are successful, more entrepreneurs want to do that, that ecosystem starts to develop. So back to technology, you know, uh, and merging with a question from the audience here. Uh, in terms of technology, what, what, what are the areas that excite, uh, the areas that excite you today? And the, the other question is, what would you do today if you were to start a business today in technology? So those two questions, uh, a little bit of a blend. Well, so like I said, if you read this paper I wrote, it's called, Re it was on Medium, Reinventing Societal Infrastructure with Technology. Those areas really excite me and basically got me to say, uh, to tell my wife for the next 20 years at least, health permitting, I'm working 80 hours a week on these problems. They're very clearly defined. Uh, I'm very interested in changing the nature of healthcare. healthcare. I think humans as experts should be obsolete within 10 years. There is no area in, in which a human should know more than an AI system, none. Now, it may take 25, 30 years for it to pervade broadly into society, but that's okay. Once you start these things, they'll keep growing as exponentials. So I said my son's building a primary care physician. Uh, we're building a mental health sort of service, which is a psychiatrist. Uh, I, I want to build, for anybody who's an expert in oncology, a primary care, uh, AI oncologist. Because most people in the world don't get an oncologist when they get cancer. So if you're talking about scaling these services, absolutely uh, lots possible in healthcare. Uh, can we make a building like this with 80% less material, tons of men material? cement, steel, other things? Absolutely, I define how to do it in my paper. Construction's a really interesting area, so we made three or four investments in construction recently. Um, I'm very interested in innovations in how you image the body. I'm very interested in innovations around transportation. So, I, you know, it's sort of almost like I'm greedy about all these areas and the large innovations. I get super excited about it. This is why I don't think I'm an investor. I make foolish investments because I'm passionate about an area. So you continue to be an unreasonable person. Uh, totally. Totally. Ask my partners that. <laughs> and how do you differentiate between the question from the audience? How do you differentiate between somebody who's unreasonable to somebody who is being a bit crazy, way too, too out there? To be honest, you can't. Can't. <laughs> All right, so unreasonable is a polite way to call somebody not well, crazy. look, here's what you can do. You can say this person has very high potential. And I said, if you take really good entrepreneurs, put them in the right markets, even if the original goal isn't attainable, they'll do something else of importance. And that happens all the time. So. I do think you bet on people, and then hopefully the right markets, but not a particular solution because it may so fail. So going back to your, your, your first point, you bet yeah. more on people than on ideas because people can pivot, but yeah. they will do something great well, in at fact, some point. In fact, most people pivot, pivot, most successful plans. I can tell you Google's plan didn't look like Google today in 1998. <laughs> 
And uh, maybe the last question here, given time. What, what advice would you give to all the rising current and aspiration entrepreneurs that you have here in the audience, given your many years of being one? Yeah. Uh, look, unreasonable goals aren't as unreasonable as they sound if you take a stepwise approach. You have to take risks, and most people are limited by what they think they can do, not what they can actually do. If they were bolder in their vision, they'd achieve much more. And it's important to realize that you won't do anything large if you're not taking risks. And risks means being willing to fail. Um, so I'm a huge fan of failure as a strategy. First, every time you fail, and I'll give you a caveat in a minute, you learn something. So every time you fail, you want to learn something, and you want to fail as often and as early as possible, because each is a learning experiment. Now, the important thing is there's smart failure and there's dumb failure. And this is the point I want to make. You set a large goal, don't test any of your assumptions, go for Mount Everest in one step, that's dumb failure. You want to fail in a way where every time you try something and fails, it's not catastrophic to your startup or to you. You fail, you waste some money, you waste some time, but you don't die as a startup. If you take risks that kill the whole startup, you don't get a second shot. So this iterative notion of failure and learning is very, very important. And some risks you take, not all failure is good failure, but lots and lots of small failures that, are, that won't kill you, but in fact will make you stronger because you're learning. Uh, that's the right way to approach. It's a very different mindset for entrepreneurs. Um, and just to give everybody an idea of what you're talking about in your long career in investing in entrepreneurship, what has been the, the worst day for you, the worst failure, the, 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 the really low point? Well, I don't know if there's one. I will say the following. There's nobody, likely there's nobody in this room who's failed more often than I have. You know, there's so many decisions I could point to. I say, duh, I was doing that. I was thinking that. I tried that. Like the number of dumb decisions I've made uh, far exceeds most people's repertoire of mistakes. Uh, it just, it, but it's okay. I, I don't care. I don't care what other people think of me when I fail. That's and so important. last thought, be internally driven. Do what you believe in, um, what you care about, not what others tell you. And then be, use this cautious failure approach. Thank you. Well, please join me in thanking Vinod. Thank you very much, Vinod. Thank you so much. Great.